opening day, I knew it was special. Everybody had a buzz. The fans had a buzz. I mean, the players had a buzz. The trainers had a buzz. Everybody had a buzz in the locker room. I always had private moments before the game. I said, I gotta jumpstart this offense. I gotta get this offense going. That's all I was thinking about. So the first, the bat to me was just trying to make something happen, get on base. The payoff pitch swung on a fly ball to left field and deep. That one's going way back, way back, and kiss it goodbye! You never know who's going to go out and go be the hero with a big home run. It's just the excitement of the unknown that keeps bringing you back to the ballpark. Eric Young, the first man to bat for the Colorado Rockies in Mile High Stadium, has brought this crowd to its feet. The inclination is you just think, well, they've had a baseball team for 30 years. It just kind of happens, right? It only happens when there's people that have the passion and the will to make it happen. A home run to deep left center field, and the snow off Pikes Peak is falling off with the decibel level of Mile High Stadium. Any community, when faced with a challenge, if they come together as people, as citizens, and put aside what other differences they might have, you can hit a home run. Baseball is as truly as old as the city of Denver. The very first field was right in front of where the Capitol is today. That was in the 1860s. George Tebow founded the Denver Bears around 1900, and the Denver Bears were the city's team. I remember my dad used to take me to see the Denver Bears when I was a little girl, and I think it started from there, then, with everyone wanting Major League Baseball here. My first memories of going to Bears games were at Merchants Park, which was located out on South Broadway. I remember we used to take the five streetcar down there. A lot of kids in the neighborhood liked to go to the games. When you walked into Merchants Park, it smelled like a ballpark with the hot dogs and the food and the popcorn and peanuts and what have you. And we were getting 16, 17,000 people. You could see that it was a baseball town. The New York Yankees were the primary team, and we were a farm team for the Yankees for years. Whitey Ford and some of those guys came through Denver, and they were kind of my idols when I was when I was growing up. Bob Housen, the owner of the Denver Bears, was never thrilled with the playing surface of Merchants Park. He wanted a nicer field. He wanted the nicest ballpark you could imagine. And that's what led to us having Denver Bears Stadium. Bears Stadium was the home of the Denver Bears up until 1960 when the Broncos then began to play at Bears Stadium. I used to go to the Bears games and when I would talk to my friends, they would say, why don't we have a Major League Baseball team? Because we had a Major League Football team, a Major Basketball team, but there was something missing. There was no major league teams between Kansas City and Los Angeles at the time. And uh, that is a big, big area with a lot of fans starving for baseball. There was talk that there'd be a professional team, but we didn't really. I mean, what are the chances? There are so many other cities that were bigger than we were. The biggest issue we had is getting Major League Baseball to finally say, we are going to start a process to determine what cities are going to get a team. We got all the clippings from the all of the many states that wanted to expand, there were 30 different cities. So 30 cities meant what? It meant a lot of senators. So <laughs> we created this task force, and a fellow named Bart Giamatti was named to be the new commissioner of baseball. So we immediately set up a meeting with Bart Giamatti, 
and then said to us, I don't see any reason why we don't expand. And everybody said, whoo, that's pretty great, you know, we got the commissioner on board. Well, just shortly thereafter, he unfortunately died of a heart attack. So we thought, oh my, you know, here we go again. We're going to start all over again. Major League Baseball then named a guy named Faye Vincent. And he understood the political situation completely. So we met with him right away and he said, great, let's just follow up what Bart said. I think it makes all kinds of sense. At which point then we had it pretty well locked politically that Major League Baseball was going to expand. There was an undercurrent in Denver in the late 70s and 80s that I sensed among particularly young people in the city. Why aren't we doing more? Why aren't we cleaning up our air? Why don't we have a better airport? Why don't we have baseball? And that undercurrent just sort of surfaced during the campaign. It's really kind of a sea change of culture and in age and in outlook and modernization. It was just a reinvestment in not only Denver, but a reinvestment in Colorado. Denver had a problem and that was it was in the middle of nowhere. And a lot of the people making decisions about whether Major League Baseball was going to be here, they don't live here. The only time they hear about Denver at all is when the airport's snowed in. And so they figure the weather's always lousy. We were saying, how do we make this work? There's a community that needs a team. How do we make this work? There were so many doubts along the way, but after you have a doubt and you think about it, you go back and say, no, we can do this. When Federico got elected in 1983, he set up the Denver Baseball Commission and Steve Kadish became the head of it. I got involved in the effort to bring Major League Baseball when I was 29 years old, at an age when you don't know any better. We were persistent, I think we were optimistic, and I think we were extremely creative. I bought the team, the Bears, back in 1984. Our goal was to try to help bring Major League Baseball to Denver, and that was the vehicle, the best vehicle that you could have to do it. Because it gave you the right to go to winter meetings, all-star games, and things like that, where you could talk to the owners or go see them personally. When we bought the team, we changed the name from the Denver Bears to the Denver Zephyrs. I remember one year, we were down in Houston, and we published a newspaper. It's called the Daily Zephyr. We tried to, uh, talk about what was happening in baseball that day and build up the city of Denver. We try to tell them how great a city of Denver would be for an expansion team. And that was the main thing to get the attention of the owners and the baseball elite that we're going to vote. No other city did that. Then in 1987 and 1988, I went back to the winter major league meetings. They said, you know, we love Denver. There's a whole time zone that we don't have a major league baseball franchise in, but you have one problem. How are you doing with the stadium? John, we're not going to play in a football stadium. And that was what I called a curveball that was thrown at us, because all along we thought Major League Baseball could play where the Bears and the Zephyrs were playing, and it seemed to work fine. If you recall Mile High Stadium, it was a phenomenon. The uh, East Stands were on water and then roll them back for baseball and bring them forward for football. But ultimately, it wasn't a baseball stadium anymore. Everyone thought of it as the home of the Broncos because they were the big league team. I'm not sure how many of us really took seriously that Colorado could get a major league baseball team. No matter what, how great a job they did, if they didn't get a new stadium, they weren't gonna have a team. It's that simple. It was a morning just like this back in 1988 on the Highline Canal, and I was running, and I was thinking about election results from the evening before. And I said, if 67% of the people will vote for the Scientific Cultural Tax District, I can get 51% of the people to vote for a new baseball stadium. Contacted a good friend of mine who was an attorney, Chet Schwartz, and said, Chet, here's my idea. We need to put together just an outline of some legislation on how this all would work. I knew nothing about writing legislation for a major league baseball stadium, nothing. I got a call from Neil Macy, and he said he had an idea of how we could bring major league baseball to Colorado. And it would only entail 
passing a tax for one-tenth of one percent or a penny on ten dollars. When Kathy agreed to take the bill, um, it was a long shot. In 85, basically, we sort of went off a cliff in Denver with the oil bust, where oil prices went to $17 a barrel, and all of the oil companies moved out and the offices became vacant. I can remember in 85 that more people left Denver than came to Denver, and it was, it was just, it was really depressed economically. Our unemployment rates were at 9.7. We had the highest foreclosure rates in the nation. We had the highest uh, business failures. It was definitely dire economic times. Our goal was to figure out the substance of the financing as to how we really could make it work, something that would be an acceptable plan for the voters, because we knew it had to go to a vote. This was a very novel concept at the time. You have to understand that most sports facilities, take McNichols or Mile High Stadium, those types of facilities usually were a local government type of deal. So how do you create this kind of novel district that would build and operate a baseball stadium when you don't really have much to go on? We didn't know how much the franchise would cost. We didn't know how much a stadium would cost. We didn't know where it was going to be located. So we had to do a lot of guessing. We spent the next two years working the legislation through the process so it could go on the ballot for voter approval. The biggest naysayers that I worried about were in this building. <laughs> to many of those folks, it was a tax is a tax is a tax. It was the topic of the day. Baseball was more of a little bit of a money issue and then a little bit of a fan kind of issue. And you just had people going back and forth on that. You know, we'd love to have baseball, but have somebody else pay for it. All we're doing is making a commitment that if, in fact, Major League Baseball will award us a team, that the taxpayers are, in fact, ready to construct that stadium. But no team, no tax. We started up with the Colorado Baseball Commission. We were just working to get everybody together to get the voters to approve it. The theme of the campaign was it's only going to cost you a penny on $10. This was a nightmare because we had, a, we had no money. If we can't change the situation, we're not going to have a stadium campaign. Both papers had covered this. It was on the front page. It was in the business part. It was even in the sports section of the newspaper about this huge jeopardy that the stadium district was put in after the campaign team had announced that they can't raise any money. And the next week, a check shows up in the office for $100,000. It was from Bill Daniels, and it had like one of those little notes attached to it, you know, from the desk of Bill Daniels, and it said, I saw in the newspaper that you were having trouble raising money, and uh, maybe this will help. And it was that first check that really started everything going. We deserve Major League Baseball. If you're for baseball, please sign. The process is basically take the 80,000 people, send them a couple postcards that tell them exactly where they need to go vote on election day. The key part of our volunteer activity was the Ironing Board Brigade. This is where all of our volunteers would show up at all of these outdoor events throughout the summer, and they'd pop open these ironing boards with a little sign on it saying, help bring Major League Baseball to Colorado. And on it, they would have these signature cards for people to say, I want to help, I want this to come to Colorado. They spent all summer gathering all of these cards from people who are fanatic baseball fans. Right before election night, the polls were showing that it was going to lose. I remember election night, it was about six o'clock, and I left my office downtown and got on the shuttle heading over to the hotel where the uh, election uh, group was meeting. And Roy Romer was on the shuttle, and he was eating an ice cream cone. And uh, so I went up and said hi to him, and he says, well, what do you think? And I says, I'm confident, I'm confident that the people of Denver are going to come through, that I think that there is a thirst for Major League Baseball here. And he says, well, I'm not so confident myself, but uh, hopefully you're right. And so, yeah, yeah. It did not pass in Denver, it did not pass in Adams County.
On this day, everyone is talking baseball. But it passed by such large numbers in Boulder County and Douglas County and Arapahoe County and Jefferson County, showing that great community support. When the vote finally passed, I mean, there was exhilaration. I mean, people were thrilled. Once the election had passed, then there was another group charged by Governor Romer for sort of taking the lead and finding an ownership group, which was a big challenge. We then had to have a pre-negotiated lease so that Major League Baseball understood what the stadium district was going to have had negotiated with this ghost of an owner. When I was governor, this was a Republican state, and we did a lot of stuff, but you don't do it unless you cooperate, and you got to find a way to, uh, uh, to mix. He said, I want you to do something. He said, we're going to go for baseball. We have to raise $95 million, and I've formed a committee, you, Trigg, and Jim Baldwin, my job in Triggs and Jim's was pretty simple. Go find $95 million. We had to be absol absolutely uh, confidential about this. There weren't a lot of people that wanted to step up that believed in baseball, that believed the fact that it, it was going to be profitable in the long run and it was going to be a hit. We announced that there was going to be a meeting at the Weston Hotel for anybody who is interested in investing in owning a part of the new baseball team. For anybody that's seen the original Star Wars where there is that bar scene where they have people from all these different planets that all look very different, that is the way that I remember that meeting because it was so odd and nobody knew who was gonna be there and nobody knew what anybody was gonna say. About 40 to 50 people showed up in this hotel suite and I announced, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna meet two weeks from today and make a decision as to what's, who's gonna organize and who's gonna own this team. But I, we want you to all go home in this two week period, form your groups. Nobody knew if some people were total BS or whether or not they were people that were really sincere. We had a lot of naysayers at the time, but the feeling was we really need to get this done. Two weeks later, we met back in the room. And after the presentations, I turned to my three advisors and said, well, let's go and confer and see what our decision is. So we went to the bathroom. We put the governor on the stool, sit there flat. And, uh, Jim and Trig and I stand around him. And uh, I said, we've got $30 million. So what do you know about the guy? I said, only one thing, he's got $30 million. The structure of many Major League Baseball teams is that you have a majority ownership group, then you have a minority ownership group. The majority ownership group consists of 51% ownership. That originally was Mickey Monas and his father, John Antonucci and his father, and a man named Kari Taraj. It was a soap opera in the early days with some of the ownership that was from out of state. Why they picked three guys from Columbus, Ohio, or wherever in Ohio, to be the general partners of a team in Denver, I never really understood. A smaller portion of the majority ownership group was Oren Benton, Jerry McMorris, and Charlie Mumford. Jerry was tasked with raising enough money to get the team here. So Jerry actually came to my father at the time and said, why don't you buy into the, to the Rockies? And he said, no, nah, I'm too old. But he said, you, you, why don't you talk to my two sons? So Jerry talked to me and he talked to Charlie and I asked Jerry a lot of questions like, what is a limited partner? What do you do? Who's in control? And I said, that just doesn't seem that fun to me. We now have the structure, I think, that we can put together a complete package and we hope to be a winning package in the Colorado Baseball Partnership have reached a binding agreement that includes a very comprehensive uh, naming, signing, media, marketing, and merchandising package that commits over $30 million. Pete got a hell of a deal, I will tell you that. But you know what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. Coors Field, what else would you ever call it? You know, can you imagine anything else?
Major League Baseball decided to have an advisory group of owners come to Denver to examine this local situation. So three or four owners showed up and we took them around. It was supposed to be a, just a quiet meeting with no extracurricular activities or what have you. But at the same time, we said, this is our one time we have a chance to really show our stuff. And so we violated their rules <laughs> big time. We've made arrangements, even if they need a long distance call on the bus or someplace else, they can do that. Yeah, well, you guys have done a great job. Yeah, we're right. this is super. We greeted them at the airport and put them all on helicopters and flew over the whole Denver area and then landed at, at uh, Bear Stadium. We got them on the bus and I got into the uh, squad car that led the bus. And the streets were filled with baseball fans and they shouted and waved and screamed and welcomed the people with lots of signs. And they, at this point, realized that something was up. <laughs> they realized the town was well aware of their visit. We pulled the bus in front of the United Bank building and I really didn't know what was to expect coming in. Once we walked in, they say there could have been about 5,000 people in a rally and, they, and we, they had to make a very narrow walkway so we could walk our way up to the stage and they started chanting baseball, baseball. And in the atrium it just, just reverberated baseball. baseball. Baseball, baseball, they began baseball. singing, take me out to the ball game, and screaming and hollering. <laughs> when they saw that, that the whole community was involved and supportive of the effort, I think that meant a great deal. The newest limited partner in the ownership was introduced to the launching crowd today. Linda Alvarado was involved in the construction business. And if Denver gets a team, she would be the second female owner in the major league. I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Um, clearly, I'm a limited partner. Marge is a general partner. But I think it elevates one more thing uh, in Denver's uh, uh, expansion bid that says something unique about the city's concern about diversity and inclusion of all kinds of people in its efforts to bring a team to our city. I made a decision to become one of the owners, make the investment, but the announcement of my ownership was held until May 8th, 1991, when there was a Major League Baseball meeting occurring here in Denver, looking at sites. The next day, Bill White, who was the president of the National League, who was at the meeting, called me personally and said, I just wanted to touch base with you because this is impressive. It's never happened before that a minority or a woman has been involved. And I just wanted to say, how are you doing? And I said, well, I'm very excited. He said, this makes a huge difference in your proposal to acquire a new team. As the owners continue to arrive until late this afternoon, every indication is Denver is all but a lock for a franchise. I think Denver and Miami are going to be approved by these two leagues in very short order. What's your advice to the fans in Miami and Denver as they await this? Buy your season tickets. Quiet in Coors Field. If the ghosts of the future were here now, they would know better than we the historical significance of what happened today. It won't be long now. Listen. He goes with the heater. It's well hit to right field. This one is out of here. Ron Mitchell, 9 News, July 5th, 1991. Major League Baseball finally announced on July 5th, five days after I left office, that we were getting a Major League Baseball team. So I'm here to congratulate all of you on the work you've done and to tell you officially that uh, at 1040, it was a Mountain Standard Time, Mountain Daylight Time, you became uh, officially uh, a member of the National League. We're probably... name the Colorado Rockies is the only name in either league that leaves no doubt of the location of the team's fans. This is a Colorado team and by golly the only thing I think of when you're at the Rockies you're looking at the top down on the rest of them and it'll only take us a couple of three years to get there. All right. We're expecting some dramatic impact. We have ordered uh, hundreds of thousands of items between t-shirts, pennants, baseball caps, um, leather coats, trash cans, you name it, we've got it ordered. It's obvious a lot of people 
and have been for the last three, four weeks unhappy with the name Colorado Rockies. I don't think Colorado Rockies is a very good name. But honestly, what difference does it make? We've got a team. I mean, look at look how many years we have struggled and fought and wished and hoped. We've got a major league team. The three sites were what is now called the Pepsi Center or the uh, Ball Arena. There was another site directly south of Mile High Stadium, now in Power Field. And then we were negotiating primarily with this site, which was owned by Union Pacific. And Union Pacific, for the most part, had all the land minus about 10 other smaller property owners. The location for Coors Field made the most sense, one, because of the centralness to the Front Range, but also the land was less expensive. We're in Lower Downtown, and it's known uh, for its industrial buildings. Uh, it's a 22-block historic district that you know protects all the historic buildings and ensures that new buildings are uh, built in the same spirit as the historic buildings. I came out to Colorado as a geologist, and when our company got sold and we all got laid off, I was out of work for a couple years and ended up starting the Wine Coop Brewing Company with uh, several partners. We opened in October 18th, 1988, when the rent here was a dollar a square foot per year. When I started trying to sell this real estate in the lower downtown, there hadn't been a actual sale from a private party to another private party. It had only been foreclosure sales for 18 months. No one had opened a restaurant in downtown Denver in five years, and there wasn't any economic activity. I remember we'd come down here on Saturdays and Sundays, and we'd sit out on the loading dock right on Winecoop Street, and look at tumbleweeds blow down the street. But there was a certain beauty there and, and a sense of, of potential. I was 29 years old, maybe, when I first started the project. You know, I remember just thinking, I mean, people look at me and think I'm too young to do a baseball stadium. It probably took me an hour and a half or so to, to draw this on tracing paper. And, you know, we had little colored pencils that you'd sharpen and make sure that's the right color. Three, two. One, pull! Hey! Are you ready? It's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball Why'd you come down here? Well, just for, to witness a historical event. I mean, this is something that's going to be going on forever now. Why did you come down here today? Just for the hoopla, it's, it's a historical type deal. I just, I think it's great. I'm really excited about baseball, major league coming in. It's, it's kind of overwhelming and, and humbling that our name, our family name will be on this field, but really it's a field for the community. I was a news photographer in Denver from 1977 to 2008, and I covered a lot of stories about the Rockies coming to town. And I thought, you know, before we know it, the stadium's gonna be 20 years old. And it's really, really important, I think, to document it being built. I remember going over to Sakura Square. I talked to them and asked if I could come up to their top level once a week and, and take a little bit of video. I didn't tell them it would take 111 weeks to do it. Time lapse, per se, wasn't a thing then. So I just crudely, framed up my shot as best I could with landmarks off in the distance. We had one goal and only one goal, and that was to open on time. No one was gonna remember anything else if we didn't open on time. We would send somebody to the post office every day and they would come back with at least one or two huge gunny sack bags full of ticket orders. This is um, essentially our first ticket system. So when we were contacting season ticket holders, um, there was a room and there was a... a war, a, we called a, it the yeah, war room. The war room. There was a handful of us that were on the phones and we were contacting uh, all of our season ticket holders in priority number order and asking them where they wanted to sit. 
the summer of 1991, Major League Baseball announced that Colorado was going to get an expansion franchise. I said, I'm gonna get the PA job for that new Colorado team. I began sending packages to the Rockies. I think the first one that I sent was a mock starting lineup. I sat down and I picked out 10 names at random and I had Anders Galarraga playing first base and I had Dante Bichette playing in the outfield and they ended up becoming Colorado Rockies. Every month I would send them something, still hadn't heard anything. I thought, well, there's no way this is gonna happen. Roy called and said, Trig, we have a problem. And I said, oops, what is it? And he said, uh, Mickey Monis is going to be indicted tomorrow morning. It turned out that the auditors had found something out, which they didn't know at the time that we had signed these guys up. I was worried about it because it was fragile and it was a while before it stabilized. Attorney Paul Jacobs is the man who brought the new owners of the Rockies together. His ability to convince people with deep pockets to join in the baseball project required diplomacy, tact, and determination. It's too bad that Paul Jacobs has passed because Paul was so instrumental in uh, making lemonade out of what was clearly lemons at the point in time. Paul acted as a bridge during that period, without which I think there would have been a lot more problems. My dad was somewhat of a magician and somewhat of an operator and, and basically pulled the right strings at the right time. He put together a document that basically signed the uh, Mickey shares over to him and allowed the team to, to continue until he could find somebody else that would step up to fill that void. And then Charlie, Oren, and Jerry stepped up and bought the general partnership. How's it going? Thank you. I never dreamed I would get to where, you know, I'm the majority owner and running the club or anything like that. That really never crossed my thought path and somehow it got to be me. I become a part of the Colorado Rockies from the MLB expansion draft in 1992, and uh, that was the Florida Marlins and the Colorado Rockies. To be honest with you, I want to go to Florida because I was scared for the call. First of all, I had to get, you know pull out the map. You know, tightening my skills on the geography. So uh, I actually uh, looked it up and I was like, well, it's in the middle of like, no, we Denver, Colorado. Had no clue. I'm from New Jersey. So then when I was talking to the Rockies and uh, the plans that they had for me, I got a little bit excited. So I said, you know what? This is the right move. That expansion draft was really one of the very first things that said, we are the Colorado Rockies. We are in Denver, and now we are picking players who are going to be on our team. The Rockies have sent their fifth pick, outfielder Kevin Weimer, to the Brewers for Dante Bichette. John Baylor, we frequented the uh, same barber shop. Baylor would come in, he's, he was a big guy, and I thought it was a great fit for him being manager of the Colorado Rockies. He also brought automatic legitimacy to the Colorado Rockies. He doesn't have to defend his record because everybody knows he was a great ball player. Came in with name tags, so you get to know each other in spring training. Don Beller pulled us aside in a meeting and he just gave us a little glimpse of the anticipation, the excitement. Just the fans just can't wait till we start the season. And I just remember guys were like locked in on them and just like taking everything in. She said, guys, enjoy the ride. I remember saying that, enjoy this ride, enjoy this journey. After years of waiting, Denver is a major league city. The Rockies became a major league team this afternoon in New York against the Mets. It was opening day in New York, and it was the opening day 
for the Colorado Rockies. There was never going to be another opening day for the Colorado Rockies. History in the making, right here, first of the Rockies. Yeah. I've always been a Met fan since then, but I'm moving to Colorado in five years. That's why I'm here. Put that on your head. Got the rock head. Great game, great day, perfect weather, go Rockies. Yeah, big time Rockies fan, can't stand the Mets. Rockies number one, yeah! Oh, we're in the sunshine, it's like Colorado. We saw the first hit, saw the first strikeout. This is beautiful. Former Commissioner Faye Vincent did the honor of throwing out the first ball. Nice gesture, certainly well deserved. Andres Galarraga put it down to the above. at 12.38 Denver time. The first hit as a Rocky, a single to shallow center field. More than a thousand Rockies fans showed up at Kurrigan Hall to hoot holler and stomp their feet every time the Rockies did something right. The Rockies organization set up bleachers and a big screen TV there. Was there ever a point today, this morning, this afternoon, where even for a second you felt I'm a part of something that's history? I think we've all felt that all spring, spring long, and uh, and to all to whoever was healthy and got to play in today's game, they are a part of you know, and or just be here really, you know, it, it is a part of history, and, and it's something you can't take away now. Rockies start their first season ever on a losing note. They are shut out by the Mets. Doc Gooden three zip. Rockies only get four hits today and play the Mets again Wednesday. Then come home, of course, for the mile high opener against Montreal on Friday. They opened the first two games in New York in 1993, and the fact that I had not heard from the Rockies by Monday when they played their first game, and then they played the second game on Wednesday, and then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday, Kevin Carlin calls and says, would you like to be the PA announcer in two days? Floats today will represent the seven games of this inaugural series here at home. That opening day parade for the Rockies, it would be like if the Rockies ever won the World Series. David E., the starting pitcher in opening day in New York, and he is being mobbed. <laughs> Look at the fans crowd around him. David Need, the most popular Rocky, I think, right now. It was just a very special moment, an interlude, but a tremendous moment between opening in New York and then opening in Denver. I didn't sleep the night before, and so coming to work, thinking everything was gonna be fine, hoping everything was gonna be fine. We are opening the gates to let 80,000 people come in. You got temporary seats that you are keeping your fingers crossed that the fire marshal is gonna approve. Fortunately, they did the morning of. Rocky Mountain baseball fans have been waiting more than 30 years for this day. We got here actually about 20 minutes after 10 this morning. Wanted to make sure we get in the parking lot. Going into, you know, the parking lot, I said, oh, man. It, it seemed like it was more people than when I played college football at Rutgers and coming, you know, before the game and then you see everybody tailgating. You know, it was bigger than that. And they were yelling already. To experience 80,000 fans in one high and opening day was, uh, I mean, that was unreal. That was unreal, that was an uh, unbelievable feeling, man. The, the noise at the ballpark and uh, all the fans in, in the city was very excited to have a, a major league team. I remember Don Baylor talked to us before the, the game and saying, you guys uh, go out there and uh, do your thing. Play hard and enjoy, enjoy, enjoy yourselves. Uh, we play in front of these beautiful people here, beautiful fans, and uh, do your best, do your best, and have fun. The count is three and one. Three balls, one strike to count to Eric Young, who is leading it off in the bottom of the first inning for the Colorado Rockies. We have no score in the ball game. Strike call, full count. I was locked in, I tell you that much. I was, I was locked in, and uh, you could just feel, you could just hear like it's kind of quiet and like waiting for something big to happen. A very pleasant afternoon, albeit clouding over just a bit. And the 3 2 pitch. Live on left field. It is mile high and out of here. When I hit it, I didn't get all of it. But I think when I hit it, 80,000 people stood up and carried that ball over the fence. I felt like there was divine intervention. Going around the bases, I was floating, so like somebody picked me up. I don't remember touching second base, third base. I don't remember any of that. I, I was like, wow, it was like a roar. 
I mean, you can hear it all the way to Nebraska, Wyoming, Utah. You can hear it all over. That's the way it felt. It was loud. I just remember thinking, everyone here is never going to forget this. I've been to a lot of sporting events, but there was nothing quite like that first home run. For us to be able to have the interest that we did for that opening day, even though it was a 76,000 seat stadium, but to have 80,227 folks come out, it showed that the interest was there for that first game, but it continued. We won 67, 70 games uh, somewhere around there, but the one thing I remember is that each game was packed. The ground at the old Mile High Stadium would actually move from the people in the stands stomping on the sands and just going nuts. In that first season, we set a lot of records, the fastest to one million fans, the fastest to two million fans, and then finally by the end of the season, we got to the final number of 4,483,350 fans came through Mile High. And that's a record that, that it's not going to be broken because that's an average of 56,000 and there's not even a stadium today that has that capacity. Everybody in the organization, all the players, all the fans knew that in two years' time, we were going to have in 1995 a brand new ballpark. It was a tremendous event to see that ballpark begin to take shape. I get a phone call from our executive director who said, we found some bones on the uh, 10 o'clock at night, know exactly where I was standing. So I thought, that's really funny, and I hung up. He called back and he said, I'm serious that we found some bones. Fortunately, I should, it was dinosaur bones, and uh, thus they came up with Dinger. There's Dinger <laughs> running out on the field. This is the skull of a triceratops. They're, I mean, one of the biggest animals that have really ever walked the earth. This is Lake Dinger, but exactly, but not, not Dinger itself. Unfortunately, Dinger isn't quite as complete as this wonderful fossil here. This is the fossil of Dinger. And so this is a fossil that was found in 1993 by a construction worker near home plate. The fossil of Dinger isn't that uh, extraordinary. The, you know, the, the discovery of it in a stadium is extraordinary. In 1994, there was a strike. 1995, the first games at Coors Field were played with replacement players. Coors Field didn't open when it was supposed to open because of the player strike or the player lockout. And then there was teams that weren't really Major League Baseball players that played two games here. The game itself was, well, almost an afterthought. After all, this was really just one big housewarming party for the Rockies. This is the first beer ever vended in Coors Field. The chairs were the same. The sights and sounds were that of baseball a game much bigger than any strike. I would like to get this thing resolved. I want to get a long-term agreement at the collective bargaining table. People were not going to pay money to see replacement players. Jerry knew it, Steinbrenner knew it, and they said, hey, we can't have this. We can't play regular season baseball with replacement players. And a short time thereafter, that strike was settled. That day particularly, having an opportunity to just kind of absorb the result of a lot of really hard work, dedication, perseverance. It's like getting your favorite toy for Christmas. I think it's gorgeous. Spectacular. Awesome. Convenient. Come on. Of course. Baseball. Let's open this place up.
my time here at opening day for Coors Field was kind of a bundle of emotions because it was the first time I saw, you know, 45,000 people in the stands. I think I walked the entire game and just watched people and how they used the different areas of the park that we'd thought about. Two and one to the dangerous Dante Bichette. A high drive, way back, and there's the storybook ending for the Rockies. The Rockies have won it on the home run by Bichette at last. When Dante Bichette hit his home run, I think there had been a rain delay. It was cold. Out of the 50,000 seats, there may have been only 25,000 people left in the ballpark by that point. And I remember thinking then, there's gonna be 100,000 people that swear they were here for Dante Bichette's home run. Yeah, it was a no doubter, which made it even better because I, you know, I, I, I would have had to sprint down the line hoping it goes over. You know, I hit it and you know, gave it the fist pump and I knew it was gone. We jumped up right on the field and I ran into the locker room. <laughs> what a great opening day. And so after all of that, it'll be a game that they'll never forget here in Denver. That was uh, great times. I mean, we we have a, a great lineup. Way to go, Vinny! It was a great experience to be part of that era with the Blake Street Bombers. The Blake Street Bombers, man, they were a group of guys who could really hit. You definitely needed a call to announce a Blake Street Bomber home run. Mine was, Dante swings, that ball's going, it ain't coming back. Deep drive, left field, that ball's going, it ain't coming back, Rockies win the game. You just go down the list of Blake Street Bombers, and every time they were at the plate, you genuinely felt as a kid, like they're supposed to hit a home run, and if they don't, I'm disappointed. But they created that. Fans made us feel like we were the only team in town. And we talking about a Bronco city. This stadium was an advantage for us. Like, we really felt that way. Like, you're able to make eye contact, you're able to talk to the fans. One of my best memories when uh, we clinched for the first time for, to go to the playoffs, when we clinched the wild card here against the San Francisco Giants. And uh, the big cat hit a catch a ground ball and when he stepped on first base and everybody was jumping because it's the first time we went to the playoffs. That was a great accomplishment because uh, only the third year in the league we went to the playoffs. This is what I love it. You know, this is, you have 50,000 people still here. They're going nuts. They're going to go nuts for a long time. This is awesome. Lodo. Yeah. Lodo. 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 Why Lodo? <laughs> because it's next. I love it. Lodo. One more time. Lodo! As in lower downtown. Denver's hottest and hippest place to be these days. It's perfect. It's fabulous. It's huge. As in huge business. Stacks and stacks of glasses served out beers and margaritas up and down Lodo's bars and restaurants. By the time Coors Field opened in 95, we were already pretty successful, but our sales went up 50% all summer. The astonishing thing was in October, November, December, our sales never went down. In other words, all the people that had walked through Lower Downtown to see baseball, really, they also got to see and experience Lodo and say, this is cool, and I want to bring my friends, and I want to come here, and so, that, it was, a, it was the greatest marketing tool probably in the, in the history of the city. And it transformed forever Lodo. It is still amazing to me to think that at one time it was the dregs of Denver. And you see what has happened to that whole lower downtown Denver area. The streets are full of people all down there celebrating baseball and getting together and communicating and having a great time. It has surpassed many of my expectations in a, in a very positive way. Yes, we still have challenges today. We always will have challenges. But from a macro perspective, Denver is doing far better than many other inner cities in the United States. And sometimes we take that for granted. The bonds for Coors Field were paid off in just eight years, which meant the tax was still in place, but we didn't have anything to spend the money on. They dove in at the capital 
and got basically they had exactly the same legislation, changed the name to football, and they put it before the voters, and the voters approved it. And so for you know one bill, we got two stadiums, one for baseball and one for football. We're not just building stadiums. We are building communities and standing tall. As my mother would tell me uh, in Spanish, empieza pequeño, pero piensa grande. Start small, but think big. And I think that's been the opportunity in Colorado. And while we're talking about baseball, it's the example that we will continue to build off to strengthen. I'm surprised as I sit here at age 93 that Major League Sports is as important as it is, but it is. It's, this nation unfortunately has things that still divide us, but sports doesn't divide us, it brings us together. It's a bright sunny afternoon and what a beautiful day for a ball game. second and be in with a double. The cat has it. The celebration began. What a season it has been. In just three years, the Rockies have made the playoffs. I'll tell you what, this game, it was just an example of how we played all year. Denver's a great city. We have a great fans and we have a fabulous team. Little Pony, Carlos Gonzalez. High drive, deep play, touch of all. He's done it. I've got goosebumps. High fly ball, deep left field. Way back. Oh, Rockies winner. How do you like that? Oh, and by the way, that's a cycle. One, two. This ball crushed deep right center field. Did he get it all? You bet. Walk off winner. Chuck Nasty. Baby, what a win. Line drive, left field. Number 2,500 is a double. Boy, October finds the most unlikely heroes. The Colorado Rockies have gone on the road and defeated the Cubs to move on to the division series. And there will be Rocktober in Denver this year. Check swing roller. Tulowitzki. Colorado's the National League champion. I love the Colorado Rockies because they give me the opportunity to become a everyday player and major league player. Whenever I step in Denver, I feel like a Hall of Famer. This is where the fans make me feel special. Every time I walk through this building, I get the same chills. I get the butterflies as if I'm playing. It's a great Hispanic community here, so I, I feel it that every day when we play here too. It's nice to feel that support when you know in, in your home country and, and see the day behind you. I love the atmosphere. There's no place like Coors Field. I love the Rockies and I love baseball. There's a lot of culture here and I think that's what makes it a good ballpark. This amazing stadium, amazing town. And for me, it's my happy place. The most wonderful part of, about this story is how people can work together and go toward a common goal and make things happen. For many, many years, Neil and I have gone to the game together on opening day, and we walk around, and it is so great to see so many people having a great time. Coors Field is such a magical place. It gets people together, it gets longtime friends together, it gets family members together. Let's go to a game, let's catch a beautiful Colorado summer sunset. Let's watch baseball, let's drink beer, let's have a hot dog, let's do all the things. 
It's community, it's big moments, it's the roar of the crowd. You see all the people, you see all the faces, you see, you know, everybody, you, you give them the little fist pump now. And walking into that stadium and walking down to your seats, it's, it's pretty amazing. Coming here is almost like coming home. It's a, it's a, it has a great feel to it. The fans are always making noise and always uh, cheering more so than anywhere else. It's hard to believe it's the third oldest ballpark in the National League. I mean, you go, okay, there's Wrigley and there's Dodger Stadium and then Coors Field, really? Whether it's a packed house, a sold out crowd, or a handful of people that stuck around on a double header day that ended with a rain delay. The excitement that's here, that you can feel, it's special. Go Rockies! Go Rockies! Go Rockies! Go Rockies! Let's go Rockies! Assistant to the general manager, Vinny Q.